Okay, let's do it. All right. Okay. I hope everyone's doing well this morning. Um, so the format, um, so my name is Feza. I'm one of the first year radiology residents. Um, and uh, today I'm gonna to be presenting on central nervous system uh, pathology. We'll break it down into two left or like Dr. Couture was saying, because it's a lot of information. The format that of this lecture, a lot of it's going to be um, um, at, like interactive. So I'm gonna have you guys answer a lot of questions. You can do this via chat and then kind of go through the lecture itself. Dr. Kachoya, do you know how I can see the chat itself when I have this in screen share mode? Because right now I can't see the chat. Uh, usually you'd have to um, like almost have two monitors. That's how I do it or uh, like, like use tab to look at Zoom so that you can kind of see like all the windows for Zoom, but I'll be watching the chat for you. Okay, okay so you can give me their final answer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well. Okay, right. and, and so uh, the other thing that I liked a lot was that people could uh, explain their rationale for how they came to the answer. That's the benefit of uh, doing it this way. But, I don't know, maybe we can get a quick vote. Did we, did we think that talking was much better or we think the chat is much better? Because I thought it, it can be a little more disruptive and um, affect the flow. I don't see people typing, but okay, let's, let's go on. I'll tell okay. you the answers. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so the topics we'll be covering in today's lecture are some key developmental uh, anomalies, some spinal cord lesion, meningitis, herniation, and cerebrovascular disease, and tumors. I'm really trying to hit uh, the high points that will be covered uh, during board exams. So there's a lot of nitty gritty uh, when it comes to neuro, but we'll try to hit the high points. And if you guys have any further questions, um, I'll let you guys email those to me, and then um, I can include them in my uh, next lecture as well. So when we're looking at developmental abnormalities, we're looking at the neural tube defect and then uh, the cerebral aqueduct stenosis. And we'll start off by talking about the neural tube itself. So we all know based on embryology, and I think Dr. Kachura's lecture also covered this, is that the neural, uh, the neural tube gives rise to the central nervous system. The hollow lumen itself turns into the ventricles and the spinal cord, whereas the neural crest cells give rise to the peripheral nervous system. And you can have uh, a malformation within the neural tube, and depending on what end it's affected, you're going to get different pathology. Um, now, does anyone know uh, what is a common vitamin that's associated with uh, neural tube defects? And you always make sure that pregnant women have significant amount of this uh, vitamin to prevent this from happening. Okay. Uh, folate, vitamin B12. Yeah, folate is correct. Yeah, so you make sure. B12. So there are quite um, a number of answers from B12. I'm sorry? Quite a number of answers on B12. Yeah. So it's so folate, folate is actually folic acid and B12. Mm -hmm. And folate is the key one here, just because you have rapidly dividing cells um, and you need that folate for that. Um, and does anyone, so because these uh, anomalies have such severe consequence on the child itself, it's very important for us to detect them earlier on because some of these pregnancies might not be viable. Do you guys know what biomarkers we kind of look for uh, when we're screening uh, uh, these pregnant women to make sure that these um, anomalies are not occurring? The judge, okay, so maternal alpha fetoprotein. Mm -hmm. There's one more. AFP mm -hmm. and acetylcholinesterase. Perfect. And yeah, so those are the two key uh, biomarkers that we look for. These biomarkers are going to be elevated in these uh, pregnant patients. And that's because of the fact that the neural tube itself hasn't closed up properly. Now, depending on what end is affected, you get different pathology. When the cranial end uh, is affected, you get encephaly, where you have absence of the skull and the brain. 
And this can result in polyhydramnosis, and that's because you have absence of the brainstem and therefore the swallow uh, mechanism, and the baby's not able to swallow the amniotic fluid, so that holds up. Uh, when the caudate end is affected, you get a phenomenon known as spina bifida, where you have failure of the posterior arch to close, and, and you actually get a defect at the posterior end. Now, this can uh, be associated with a pouch, however, not all the time. When it's occult, you just have a dimple or a patch up here. But when it is associated with a cystic protrusion, you can have just the meninges involved or the meninges and the spinal cord. Hey, Pisa, mm -hmm. so um, uh, there's a comment that uh, your voice is a little distant. So oh. I don't know if you need to move closer. Yeah, can you hear me better now? I tried to put my headphones on, but for some reason it wasn't connecting well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the audio button, if you end your talk and just look at audio button, you can select a microphone. Uh, two, 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 two. I don't see an audio button. I see maybe more. Mm -hmm. So let me... I see. Let me share my screen. Okay, hold on one second. So, so if you look at my screen right now. Hold on, I'm trying to get to your screen. Yes. So this this button here, mute or so you can select see. your microphone and, and select your screen. Right so you can see if that helps. I all I see is your messages at the moment. I don't see any you or. Oh, okay. Um, let me try. I'm trying to see if I have my. Because I tried connecting my headphones and they connected to the computer itself, but for some reason, Zoom is not. Yeah, so look at Zoom and look at mute below there. Um, yeah. So um, kind of going back to spina bifida, so uh, we talked about how it could be associated with a cystic protrusion um, or not. Um, and when it is, it could only involve, sometimes it only involves the meninges, sometimes it involves the meninges and the spinal cord. Do you guys know the nomenclature when it only involves the meninges? What is that called? Okay, um, so we have meningocele. Mm -hmm. And then when you have the spinal cord involvement in it as well. Okay, so a couple of answers, meningocele, meninges, uh, meningomyelocele. Perfect. And it's the meningomyelocele, which is actually uh, more detrimental Detrimental because the spinal cord is also protruding out. You have risk of spinal cord compression, and these patients can present with uh, neurological uh, defects. Now, moving on to the second most common um, anomaly, um, a genital anomaly, is cerebral aqueduct stenosis. It's one of the leading cause of non communicating hydrocephalus, um, and it will present with enlarged head circumference due to dilation of the ventricles. Remember, uh, when we're born, our sutures are not closed, so that allows our brain, our skull, the ability to expand itself. It's kind of helpful because it allows um, it allows us to release some of the pressure that's putting being put onto the brain parenchyma as the ventricles themselves are expanding. So there's two conditions that are associated with this. We'll go over, but just quickly, just kind of going over the normal anatomy of the ventricle. So remember, you have the lateral ventricles. Right here, uh, they uh, drain into the third ventricle via the foramen of Monroe, and that uh, drains into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. And um, the cerebellum plays a key role in formation of that fourth ventricle, and that's important to keep in mind uh, when we actually discuss the pathology itself. So these are the two key pathologies that you want to keep in, in the back of your head when you have a small baby presenting with an enlarging head circumference and image finding is significant for um, non-obstructed hydrocephalus. So with how do you differentiate the two? So in Danny Walker's, you actually have a developmental abnormality where your cerebellum uh, is absent. And so you get this massive dilation of your fourth ventricle. 
Whereas uh, Chiari malformation in type two in particular, you actually have downward displacement of the cerebellum, the vermis and the tonsil uh, through the foramen magnum, and that causes the cerebral aqueduct to stenose and resulting in the um, non-obstructed hydrocephalus. Okay, now we're gonna move on to spinal cord lesions. There's a bunch of high yield spinal cord lesions that you need to kind of know about. We'll go through each one of them and each one of them tends to affect each pathology affects a different part of the spinal cord. So just to kind of briefly, I know this slide has a lot going on, but uh, kind of just what I tried to hit with this slide was just major pathways you kind of have to have a good understanding of to understand the pathology itself. So spinothalamic tract, that is uh, the key tract for pain and temperature sensation. Um, it starts off out in the periphery, you have your peripheral nerves, uh, synapse onto the posterior horn, and then uh, the cell bodies, uh, their, their axons then cross over via the anterior commissioner and then ascend via the uh, spinal thalamic tract to the thalamus and then to the cortex so you can register the sensation of pain and temperature. The dorsal column, this is for fine movement and proprioception. Again, you have peripheral nerves coming in. Uh, to the dorsal root, and then they travel um, via the dorsal column to the medulla where they cross over and ascend to the thalamus and then to the cortex. Uh, you also have the hypothalamic uh, tract that's also an ascending tract. It arises from the lateral horn um, at around T1, and then it synapses onto superior cervical ganglia, ganglia where then it innervates um, your face and provides a lot of sympathetic innovation there. Um, a descending tract to keep in mind is a lateral cortical spinal tract. So you have the pyramidal neurons in the cortex which descend and cross over uh, within the uh, uh, medulla, the pyramids there, and then they synapse onto the anterior motor horns. And those axons then go and synapse on to the muscle itself. So kind of keeping these, uh, uh, keeping these tracts in mind is really gonna help us understand the pathology that we're going to cover next. So syringomyocele is the first pathology we're going to cover. Here you have a cystic degeneration within the spinal cord. This can happen in the setting of trauma or it could be associated with type 1 uh, Chiari malformation. Now the usual location for this lesion is around C8 and T1. This is important to understand because a lot of the sensory input and motor input to your upper extremity is coming in around this time. And a lot of that sympathetic outflow is also right at the T1 um, region. Um, and the particular location that is affected here is the anterior white um, commissioner. That's remember, that's where the, um, that is where the doors, uh, you have the uh, peripheral input coming in to the dorsal ganglia and then they switch over and go up into this uh, via the spinal thalamic tract to the cortex. So not surprisingly, the clinical presentation is going to be they're going to have decreased pain sensation and temperature uh, starting off in their arms. And as the lesion progressively gets larger, it's going to start to involve other tracts that are surrounding it, like the anterior horn, uh, which puts a lot of motor output to the periphery, so you can have a lot of lower motor neuron signs occurring later on as the disease progresses. And you also have involvement of the lateral horn, which is a lot of sympathetic outflow to your face and you get Horner syndrome as a consequence of that. Um, the anterior horn itself, remember we talked about how, uh, uh, we talked about the anterior horn's relationship to the uh, cortical spinal tract. That's where we get all the voluntary motion coming through. There's two particular disease processes that you have to keep in mind uh, when someone's presenting with lower motor neuron uh, symptoms or upper motor neuron symptoms. Um, it could be either infection via the polio virus. Uh, so here it's attacking the anterior horn where your lower motor neurons are sitting and they're gonna present with uh, lower motor neuron deficit signs such as flaccid paralysis. They're gonna have atrophy of muscle weakness and impaired reflex and uh, negative Babinski sign. This in contrast to Wigner Hoffman's disease, this tends to be more of an inherited disease. This is gonna be a baby that's born with an anterior motor neuron damage, this autosomal recessive. And just like an adult would present with uh, lower motor neuron sign, now you have a baby presenting with 
um, these sides. So that's one way you can differentiate the two. Now, um, amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis says this is degeneration disorder that involves the both the anterior horn as well as the cortical spinal tract. So the upper motor neurons are really within the cortical spinal tract, lower motor neurons are located within the um, anterior horn. Uh, so if the anterior horn is affected, uh, what type of symptoms would you get? Just based off of what we just went over. Okay, so uh, muscle atrophy. Mm -hmm. So you really be getting all of those lower motor neuron symptoms that you would also see with polio or the other inherited degenerative disease, right? And when the lateral cortical spinal tracts are affected, then you're getting upper motor neurons. So now instead of getting flaccid paralysis, you're getting spastic paralysis. Instead of getting loss of reflexes, you're actually getting um, increased, uh, you have hyperreflexia. And so these patients tend to, tend to have like a confusing picture because they'll have not only lower motor neuron sign and symptoms, but also upper motor uh, sign and symptoms. Um, now, you, in both cases, like in this disease process, you get atrophy and weakness of the hand as the early signs um, of the disease itself. So this is very similar to tringlomyelia. So how do we distinguish between the two diseases? Still waiting for some answers. <laughs> Just remember uh, when we talked about single myelia, we talked about the cystic lesion within the anterior commissioner tract of the spinal thalamic tract. So, what do we see in that disease process that we don't see here? Both in wolf, start with the involvement of the upper extremity. Okay, so there's sensory findings. That's yes, so the they are mostly sensory. Uh, and mm -hmm. it affects the lower limb. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Yep, exactly. Just looking at those uh, sensory finding is key. We'll distinguish the two. So just All right. to that, to that uh, slide. So this is, this I found very, very confusing, right? So you have to almost figure out how you're going to remember what mm -hmm you know, upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. And these are things that we usually uh, in, the, in the hospital you're doing. For example, you can know that uh, if someone has a stroke, right? You had your patella hammer and you're doing the Babinski sign. And so, mm -hmm. and also, you know, you, you most likely have examined someone with this. And if you use sort of like some of those symptoms, then that's going to help you remember. Because what happens is that the examiner likes to put long questions, mm -hmm. you, right? So then you'll be like, oh man, what was this again? What was this flaccid paralysis? Then what was this? So you kind of have to figure out, oh, when I see positive Bobinski, I know that's an, you know, an upper motor neuron. Versus mm -hmm. yeah. So just figure out some gamesmanship around this. Agree. Agree. Um, so Frederick's ataxia, this is a degenerative disorder, um, inherited degenerative disorder, which involves both the cerebellum and the spinal cord, and it can involve different tracts within the spinal cord, so the presentation really varies. The fact that it involves the cerebellum, um, going back to like the anatomy lecture, what are some symptoms do you think that these patients will present with, just knowing that there's involvement of the cerebellum? I know Walter, okay, ataxia. Ataxia. Yeah, that's the key, right. So if you're saying ataxia in the setting of uh, pain and temperature loss, um, as well as, you know, upper motor neurons, lower motor neuron signs, that should really point you to it, Frederick's ataxia. Um, it's ataxia is in the name of the disorder itself. So this is an autosomal recessive uh, disease, and it's uh, due to an unstable trinucleotide repeat in the frataxin gene. Do you guys remember what those trinucleotide repeats are? Going back to the genetic. GAA? Yes, perfect. Um, again, it's Attached. because it's in an inherited. Oh, it, no, 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 I'm just making a smart comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, because it's an inherited disease, um, it presents in childhood and progressively 
um, uh, and it's a progressive disease, and it gets to a point where the patient becomes a wheelchair bound uh, uh, within their teenage years. Now, this is actually associated with a cardiac pathology, uh, and it's something that they like to test a lot. Do you guys know? Actually, Sheila, Sheila Rose said gate, so you can remember as G A A. I, I presume that's what you were trying to say for the autosomal recessive uh, repeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was right. Uh, that was right. G A A. That's the um, repeated trinucleotide sequence. But what type of cardiomyopathy is uh, associated with these patients? And so, sometimes that's what the patient end up dying from, then the motor dysfunction. So there's dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Epstein anomaly. So it's the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the key one to remember. Uh, and it's really, again, secondary to this trinucleotide repeat uh, that also affects the interventricular septum and results in this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And remember, these are like young athletes with sudden cardiac death occurring. Okay, so now um, this one, and you guys can let me know exactly which formats you prefer. I try to mix up the teaching style to really get your input as to what to do for the next lecture. So now you have a 32-year-old male presenting with headache, mucoviditity, and fever. So what do you guys think is the diagnosis? What test should you order? What are you guys thinking? Meningitis. Mm-hmm, that could be it. Anything else? Just a couple of answers of meningitis. Right. Um, but we definitely know that's within the CNS. Could it be a bleed? Sure. Why not? But the fever trying to kind of like wears us off to more of an infectious etiology, um, right? And then, uh, so if you are thinking meningitis, what are the tests you would think about ordering? Uh, lumbar puncture after mm -hmm. you endure, there's no raised intracranial pressure. Okay. How would you make sure that there's no increased intracranial pressure? What are you looking for on physical exam or do you, would you order an imaging for that? So clinical check for papilledema. Yes, perfect. Okay, you can do a CT. Uh, mm -hmm. so papilledema and CT are the main answers. Yeah, what, what are you looking for in the CT? Okay, so in the CT, you're looking for the flattening of the gyri, midline shift, serene. Right. So all of these answers are incredible. They're great. Um, you're looking for increased intracranial pressure, right? Papillary edema and, um, uh, and as well as like what we were talking about, like the midline shift and herniation, I think you want to look at before you actually go in and do an LP on someone. Make sure they don't have intracranial pressure, uh, elevated intracranial pressure. So great answer. So meninges, again, what does what does that mean? That's just inflammation of your leptomeninges. Now going back to normal a little bit, meninges consist of three layers, like we covered in the anatomy lecture. You have the PL layer, which is closest to the brain, then you have the arachnoid, and then the dura layer. And the, these layers uh, are between the brain itself and the skull. And it's only the P and the arachnoid that together make up the leptomeninges. Um, and it's important to know, uh, when you're looking at meningitis, to know the actual etiology. Um, as to the causative agent. So in neonatin, what are some common bugs that can cause meningitis? Guys, you know, this is super high yield. Gamesmanship. You're going to look for the age, and then you're going to look for if they're immunocompromised, and you'll always get this answer. So neonates, GBS, E. coli, mm -hmm. people who are yeah. um, GBS, uh, he, um, I think it's hemophilus influenza. That's for non-vaccinated infants, but that's great. Yeah, there's one more in the neonate. Uh, Listeria. Perfect. Yeah. So those are the three I was looking for: the neonate and the non-vaccinated one was H influenza. Perfect. What about children and teenagers? 
It can be accompanied by petechial rash. Neisseria. Yeah, perfect. And what about adults and elderly? What are you thinking? So uh, for that, children and teenager, we've got a couple of answers. So Neisseria, oh. E. coli, meningococcal, strep pneumo, Neisseria. Mm -hmm. Those are actually all of my correct, but the most, most common one is Neisseria. But yeah. And what about elderly and adults? Strep pneumo. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And what's the most common cause of viral meningitis? I wonder if that answer will change now. But... Yeah, yeah, that is true. Mm. Happies. Uh, Enterovirus. It's... Okay. The most common viral cause is actually Coxsackie, and we'll get to that. Um, and then immunocompromised. What is one thing that you want to keep in the back of your head when uh, HIV patient comes in with headaches and um, signs of? This one has so many answers. Yeah. Yeah, fungal. Yes, perfect. So fungal etiologies are some things you don't want to forget. And I, you guys did great. Um, you hit each and every one of them. Perfect. So we talked about in order to diagnose it, you would do a lumbar puncture. So it's actually important to know exactly where you're performing it and exactly uh, what sample you're obtaining. So at what level would you actually perform a lumbar puncture? And what space are you entering? Where are you collecting that fluid from based on that anatomy lecture? Okay. So we have L3, 4, L3, 4, L4, 5. Mm -hmm. And what's, why, um, why so low? Like what's your thought process as to? And then the Ilia crest top. Mm -hmm. Those are used as landmarks, good. And what space are you getting the fluid from? Subarachnoid space. Yep, perfect. Um, so the correct answer is L4, L5, as the spinal cord itself ends at L2, uh, but the subarachnoid space and quadraquina continues beyond that. This way you're sure that you're not hitting the spinal cord and you're not going to cause any type of damage to the patient. And the space that you're entering, again, you go from the segment, uh, from the skin, through the ligament, through the epidural space. Uh, through the dura and the arachnoid, and you end up in the subarachnoid space where the CSF is, and then you collect the sample from that. Now, it's important to be able to um, diagnose the patient based off of CSF findings. So here we have a couple of scenarios that you might see in your question stem, and it's, it, you should be able to come up with the answers fairly quickly. So if you obtained the CSF sample and you saw it was neutrophil predominant with low glucose, so what type of, uh, what is the cause? Is it bacterial, viral? Um, what are you thinking, fungal? Bacterial, bacterial, bacterial. Um, those are not my answers, I'm just reading them. If they're yeah. many answers, <laughs> pasta. Yeah, lots of Yeah. Bacteria. Yes, because a neutrophil predominance tells you that it's bacterial. Bacteria, since you consume glucose, that's why your levels of glucose are gonna go low. Now, what if it is lymphocytic predominant with low protein? Okay, viral. Yes, and the way I remember this, first of all, lymphocytes, uh, virals, uh, viruses tend to infect the cells and actually go inside of the cells. So you need lymphocytes to be able to detect viral infections. So I know it's gonna be lymphocytic, uh, a lymphocyte predominant. Also, uh, viruses don't make their own protein, right? They use the proteins of, the, uh, of our cells. So that's how I know that the protein level is gonna be low as well. So that's perfect. What if, what if they were lymphocytic predominant, but had about normal to high protein and normal to low glucose? What are you thinking then? And, but it, and I knew also said, you know, just a reminder, bacteria has utilized glucose in the infection. So mm -hmm. something else. So uh, right now, the answer that I have, one answer is fungi. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Yep. So fungus are also lymphocytic predominant, but the way you can differentiate viral and fungal infection is just looking at the protein levels um, in, in these patients. And fungus, 
if fungal infection, they're going to be normal to high, but in viral, they're going to be low. Now, what if it's monocyte predominant and very low, very, very low glucose level and elevated protein? This is a particular type of pathogen that I'm trying to look for. It's very common on no, board. I'm sorry? TB, tuberculosis. Yes, perfect. You guys are incredible. Why is this not going forward? Yep. That's great. And so what are some complications of meningitis that you guys can think about? Um, that long-term complication, short-term complication, what can happen to these patients that as a clinician you have to kind of worry about and keep in the back of your head? Okay. Uh, guys, what are, okay, encephalopathy, short-term mm -hmm. convulsions. I'm sorry? So encephalopathy, hydrocephalus, short mm -hmm. convulsions, lots of hydrocephalus, 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 brain and why? space occupying lesion, brain abscess. Mm -hmm. So why hydrocephalus? That is one of the most common complications, but what is causing that and what type of hydrocephalus would you get? Don't let me down. I already talked about this on my lecture. <laughs> Okay, good. So you have blockage of the arachnoid granulations by pass. Yes, perfect. Um, so, yes, I didn't hear the last part of that. I'm sorry. No, so um, someone said normal pressure, but I was just saying that, so it's an obstructive hydrocephalus, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. So this can actually be, meningitis can be very severe and can result in death, and that's due to uh, because you have so much in uh, increased intracranial pressure, it can cause herniation. You can have compression of the brain stem, which kind of controls all of your breathing function and your heart rate um, and can result in death. And then hydrocephalus is a common complication. Hearing loss and seizures can also occur. And that's due to fibrosis. And that's secondary to just the healing process, right? All the hydrocephalus due to the healing process, hearing loss and seizure are also due to the healing process because as your body heals from inflammatory pathways, it deposits a lot of fibrotic tissue. And um, the fibrotic tissue within the sub, uh, subarachnoid granules uh, in, uh, impedes its ability to reabsorb this FESF fluid. And then that's why you get hydrocephalus. You can have fibrosis of the nerves occurring. And then focal fibrosis within the brain parenchyma can increase the risk of seizure in these patients. All right. So one of the, uh, the complications of this we talked about was herniation, and that could be a pretty deadly complication. So there's different types of herniation. Uh, tonsil herniation, when you have displacement of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magen. So what is the subsequent complication uh, when this happens? Mm -hmm. as, Why as do we worry answer, about that? As people answer this question, uh, there's mm -hmm. a question here, actually. Are there specific features on imaging that tell you there's TB meningitis? I had a patient recently, no cough, but they had reduced consciousness. On imaging, they came up with TB as a specific etiology of the meningitis, and I'm not sure what they saw. It wasn't just a tuberculoma. Thing, so. Hmm. I I know that uh, don't you get like uh, enhancement of the meningitis itself, but that'd be non-specific for any type. I. I I would have to look more into that, but I'll get back to you um, on that. But you're right. Next There's no way that you can look at, at, at this and decide that this is TB meningitis unless you had like a chest X-ray that showed <laughs> this patient has, uh, you know, uh, maybe signs of TB, but there's mm -hmm. no way that you can look at a CT or an MRI and decide that you can say that this is meningitis and the complications, but you cannot mm -hmm. say that... I know that this is bacterial meningitis or this is tuberculosis meningitis. Mm -hmm. So why do we worry if someone has tonsil herniation? What are we worried about? So br compression of the brainstem leading to yeah. death. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you can get cardiopulmonary arrest uh, secondary to the brainstem again. Like we talked about, those are the centers where your uh, respiration is controlled, your heart rate is controlled, um, and that can be very severe and result in death. Uh, Subfoxine is displacement of the cingulate gyrus under the uh, fox cerebrae. Uh, and what are some consequences, uh, consequences of this type of herniation? Think back to anatomy. Um, 
what vessels can be affected if you have this type of displacement. And so guys, this is the type of question uh, uh, Irene says ACA. Uh, I don't know if you mean the anterior cerebral artery, but these are the type of questions that are twofold, right? You have to understand what goes through there and then you have to understand the pathology. And this is a common way of testing uh, neural questions, which is why if you remember what anatomy is there and what's important for you to remember, then you can sort of correlate the two and remember both. So a uh, couple of answers of compression of anterior cerebral artery, and there's also uh, vertebral arteries or uh, basilar artery compression. Um, so vertebral arteries are more posterior. I don't think they would be affected, but uh, anterior communicating, uh, sorry, anterior cerebral artery uh, does get compressed as well, just like Dr. Couture is saying, it's going through that singular gyre and it kind of it tracks like straight up and goes around. So I'm, I'm going to put a picture in next time. Me flying in the air is not going to help. Um, so that can result in infarction and the patient will then present um, with uh, focal neuro, uh, neurological defects. Um, another type of herniation is uncle herniation. Now you have displacement of the temporal lobe um, uh, under the tentorium cerebellum. Uh, so what type of complications can you get here? Again, this is very anatomy heavy. You need to know what nerves are going through, uh, what vessels are traveling through here. Okay, so we have cranionav three. Perfect. Uh, Sheila, I'm assuming you meant 11? Oh, three? Okay, three. You just three, yeah. And what would the patient present with when you have um, cranial nerve 3 palsy? So you have ipsilateral blown pupil, toes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be down and out and dilated. Any vascular compromise at all? Um, Durette hemorrhages. Yeah, those are small uh, perforating hemorrhages of the brain stem. Yeah, and also your posterior, uh, posterior cerebral artery um, can be compressed and that could lead to um, what do you call infarct of your occipital lobe. Um, and that causes hemianopsia with macular sparing. Your central vision is spared, but your peripheral vision is affected there. Um, on the contralateral side. So you guys got it. Compression of cranial nerve 3, compression of posterior uh, cerebral artery, and then you can have the rupture of paramedium arteries, uh, and that results in brainstem hemorrhages. Um, so now we have another question. So you have a 60-year-old female presenting with facial droop, a right-sided weakness, which started three hours ago. What's the, what's the likely diagnosis? What tests are you thinking about ordering and why? Uh, we have stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, as people answer that, there's a question. This is the one which I'm assuming you're talking about the ankle herniation. Is the one with the Keno Hans approach notch uh, if it progresses? And yes. So it's a Keno Hans notch is a cerebral pendacle in identification associated with some forms of transtentorial herniation, which is also known as the ankle. Mm -hmm. So it's pre predominantly injury, primary injury on the opposite hemisphere of the uh, brain. Okay. So we have stroke, 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 ischemic infarct, non contrast mm -hmm. CT, stroke, brain CT, brain CT. You want to get contrast CT? Why contrast CT? What oh, are you trying to look The answer at? was non contrast. Oh, non contrast. Perfect. Yes. Um, and what are you trying to look for? Are you trying to look for stroke on the non-contrast or like, what are you looking for? Okay, so you're looking for hemorrhage? Yes, and that's because that's gonna dictate your management of the patient. Um, so that's great. So now this is a perfect segue into cerebrovascular disease. So 
neurological defects occur due to cerebrovascular compromise. Now that, and the most common causes are ischemic or hemorrhage, um, can both result in a cerebrovascular compromise resulting in neurological deficits. Neurons are very dependent on serum glucose, oxygen supplies, uh, and uh, glucose is their main source of energy, and they're su very susceptible to ischemic damage. Within three to five minutes of not receiving blood, um, not receiving oxygen, not getting that glucose, you can start to see damage within the neurons themselves. Remember, even during our starvation phase, um, when someone's fasting for a prolonged period of time, all of the rest of our body is able to use ketone as a main source of energy. The brain is one key part that still requires glucose. It's highly dependent on that. Um, so when you're thinking about neurological deficit, you want to think about whether the cerebrovascular compromise is global and focal. And the symptoms will kind of help gear you um, exactly which way uh, the patient's presenting. When we're talking about global ischemia, it could be secondary to low perfusion. You can have significant calcified disease of the carotid artery, which is limiting the amount of blood that's getting to your brain. It could also be due to acute, uh, uh, due to acute decrease in blood flow. Let's say someone has cardiac arrest and their heart isn't pumping. Now the brain is not getting any blood. And it could be due to chronic hypox uh, hypoxia, secondary to anemia. They're just not, uh, they're not, they don't get enough oxygen because uh, their uh, red blood cell turnover is so rapid. And then hypoglycemia um, states can also result in global, um, global ischemia because they're not getting enough, um, enough nutrition source to function. When this is mild, you can, your patient can present with just transient confusion. They might be a little bit confused, but when it gets to the opposite spectrum and it's very severe, they can almost go into a vegetative state because so much of your brain parenchyma is compromised. However, when it's in the middle, uh, it tends to affect more of the water, uh, watershed region and vulnerable regions of the brain where you'll see um, areas where the ACA and MCA share territory or where the MCA and P they share their territory. When it's focal, right, it's just regional ischemia to the brain. And when this occurs, it's important to kind of figure out, is it a TIA versus stroke? And it really depends on how long these symptoms last. In less than 24 hour, it's a transient ischemic attack. Greater than 24 hours, it's a stroke. But when someone comes in acutely, presents a neurological deficit, you don't think about a TIA. That's a diagnosis you make in retrospect. You treat it as if it's a stroke. Um, and uh, again, focal um, ischemia can also occur due to, uh, due to uh, intracerebral hemorrhages as well. When you're looking at stroke, there's many different uh, causes of it. One is thrombotic, where you have rupture of a pre-existing plaque, and now it includes uh, the complete vessel lumen. Now, uh, plaques tend to form at branch points because you have a lot of turbulent flow and recurring damage occurring to the lumen, which promotes plaque formation. Another type is embolic, where a plaque somewhere else, small part of the plaque somewhere else breaks off, travels up to your brain, and then uh, blocks off one of the arteries in your brain. And when this is the um, case, you want to try to look for sources. And some of the common sources are your carotids as well as your heart, especially in patients who have AFib. Um, and the vessel that's most commonly involved is mid-cerebral artery. You have uh, another type of stroke is the stroke. This is hyaline arteriosclerosis uh, occurs uh, of the vessel, which narrows the vessel lumen and decreases the flow through the vessel. And it's a complication of hypertension. And it tends to affect the lenticular striated vessels coming off the anterior communicating artery and, uh, sorry, the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. And it tends to affect the internal capsule and the thalamus itself. So you'll see that they can have purely motor symptoms or purely uh, sensory symptoms, depending on what area is affected. So this just kind of summarize all three on one slide for you guys. So when someone does come up uh, with symptoms and signs of stroke, one of the first things that you get is CT without contrast. You're trying to rule out hemorrhage. Uh, you might occasionally see signs of ischemia, which include uh, loss of gray-white differentiation, a lot of edema that's extending all the way up to the 
cortex, you might see that. And you're not really banking on that. What you're trying to see is whether or not there's a bleed because that's going to affect your management. And later on, as the patient is improving or once you've initiated the acute management, you can get an MRI just to see the extent of the ischemia itself or the stroke itself. Now, once that is done, it's important to try to figure out exactly where, uh, what was the origin of the stroke, right? We talked about is uh, a lot of the causes are thromboembolic, meaning the plaque was somewhere else, broke off, and now we have infarct in your brain. So uh, you have to get an echo on these patients, uh, look for arrhythmias because ACIV increases the risk of uh, clots forming within your heart, and those can then uh, travel up into your brain and you also want to get ultrasound of the carotid or you can get a CTA uh, just to look at the clot burden there. Uh, management wise, one of the first things you do whenever you're suspecting someone has stroke, give them aspirin, give them statin, and that's also the long-term management for the patient. Uh, but once, uh, once you know that there is no hemorrhage on CT, you start TPA. Do you guys remember what's the window for TPA? Um, within what time interval is TPA actually effective? As people, oh, wow. Okay, so um, we have three to four minutes, four hours, four hours, three to point four five hours, three hours. So three to 4.5 hours uh, is the correct time that studies have shown that if we reperfuse by this time that we do get uh, a lot of the function, uh, function back of the tissue and don't cause a lot of free radical damage to the tissue itself. Now, there are certain exclusion criteria to um, take into account when you're thinking whether or not to give someone TPA. Do you guys remember that? Because this is going to be really important because you can have a patient presenting with stroke-like symptoms, but then you really can't give them TPA because their history includes some of the exclusion criteria. Okay. Recent surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, if they're on warfarin or bleed a lot. If they're mm -hmm. anticoagulated. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have a coagulation disorder. If there's hemorrhage or risk of hemorrhage. Okay. So prior history hemorrhage. of stroke or GI bleed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if they're at risk of bleeding or they're currently bleeding or they had a recent stroke because strokes, like we'll talk about one of the complication is you can get hemorrhagic conversion occurring, right? Um, you have to be very careful and judicial about whether or not to give them TPA. But normally if they have any uh, recent surgery, um, risk of bleeding, um, head trauma within the last three months, or a, a recent intracranial surgery, and that's really important. And within the abdomen, that's fine, but whether or not it was in the head is very key. Um, and these patients should not be receiving uh, TPA. Uh, once you have given the patient TPA, it's very important to get good bl uh, blood pressure control because now they're anticoagulated. You don't want any of their, you don't want rupture of vessels secondary to high blood pressure occurring in these patients. So that's the secondary management goal that you have. Once now a, we have a. Uh, there's a comment here people are writing platelets uh, and INR. I've never seen that lab values to be a contraindication for for TPA administration, but I have to check that. Yeah, the only thing you can think about is like really severe uh, thrombocytopenia. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have to take that into account, but it has to be like really, really low. Um, those, and I think the INR too, it has to be on the extreme end, but the main things that, which, are, which is good, um, uh, that's good, uh, good things to point out, but the main things that I've seen them test is mainly hemorrhage, uh, prior stroke, um, and then recent surgeries. But you're right, if it's severe thrombocytopenia, that also can be um, contraindication in these patients. So 60-year-old female presents with focal neurological deficits. Uh, per patient, she's been experiencing headache, multiple episodes of vomiting. During examination, patients start seizing. Um, you get a CT of their head, and this is what you see. What do you think is going on? So I'll go back to the presenting symptoms. So focal neurological deficits, headaches, vomiting, and then patients start seeping while you're examining the patient. Get a CT. 
non-con and this is what you see. Okay, intra, intracerebral hemorrhage, intra, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know what ICP is. Inter, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, yep. Okay. Well, ICP is intracranial pressure, like elevated intracranial pressure, but yeah, so the, uh, you're right, the headache and multiple episodes of vomiting tell you, tell you that there's increased pressure within the brain. And that's correct. And seizing also tells you that. But uh, what is the actual cause? It's like someone pointed out, it's inter, uh, intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. So what this means is that you have parenchymal hemorrhage. And most common cause, like we were talking earlier, is stroke. When you have hemorrhagic conversion of stroke occurring, uh, you can actually have bleeding occurring into the ischemic parenchyma. Other causes that can result in parenchymal hemorrhage are hypertension, vasculopathies, uh, where you can get penetrating vessels, uh, uh, develop pseudoaneurysm due to uh, chronic, uh, due to chronically being exposed to such elevated blood pressure, uh, which can then rupture. Um, and this is mainly the basal ganglia and that, uh, that, that's going to be affected. You can have cerebral amyloid angiopathy, the amyloid protein being deposited in the vessels, and that actually weakens the vessel wall, increasing the risk of bleeding, and vascular malformation can also result in it. Presentation, like we talked about, there's, uh, you're going to see signs of uh, increased intracranial pressure, such as headache, drowsiness, vomiting, and seizure. And for diagnosis, you get a non-con uh, CT where you'll see, um, uh, well, you see bleeding, very similar to the image before. Uh, where you'll see bleeding within the parenchyma itself. And you see it's like almost like a space occupying lesion. It's compressing that uh, lateral ventricle right there. Um, and then MRI can be done subsequently to try to actually figure out what the underlying cause is. Management is if they are on any type of anticoagulation to stop or reverse it, and blood pressure control is very important for these patients. This is kind of a little bit more advanced, maybe like step three material, but something to kind of start thinking about as you are studying. And you can um, solidify that as you move throughout the years. So then you have another patient, a 40-year-old female presenting with uh, sudden severe headache, nausea, vomiting, meningeal irritation, and then subsequently has loss of consciousness. You, what is an image that you want to get in this patient? Or do you want to get an imaging? Is there another type of test you want to do? Um, so there's a comment on subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Right, so I would uh, start with getting a CT, non-con CT, and what we see is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so you see um, that it's within the um, uh, sulci, the, the blood's actually within the sulci itself, and that indicates not like a mask-like space occupying lesion that we saw with intraparenchymal hemorrhage, and it's almost um, going right it's diffusely present within the sulci. Sometimes it can also be within the uh, ventricles itself, because remember the ventricles uh, ultimately go and communicate with the subarachnoid space. Okay. So subarachnoid yeah, hemorrhage is correct. Question, yeah, and maybe you'll talk about it. Is how do you differentiate between subdural and epidural hemorrhage? Yeah, we're going to get to that. We're going to have um, cases on that. Okay. Uh, so subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have bleeding occurring within the subarachnoid space. So remember that's between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter. And it's the uh, most common cause is actually trauma. And the most common cause of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is aneurysmal rupture. Uh, one of the first most common sites is um, anterior communicating artery. Second most common is posterior communicating artery. And third is the uh, middle cerebral artery. Um, other causes other than, uh, you know, aneurysm or trauma include vascular malformation, arterial dissection can also result in this, especially proximal, uh, especially, I'm sorry, distal carotid. Um, and then clinical presentation, this is like the thunderclap headache, uh, worst headache of their life, right? Nausea, vomiting, uh, again, secondary to increased intracranial pressure and then loss of consciousness. We went over the diagnosis itself. Again, you get a non-con CT, and if CT is negative, you still have high suspicions. Then you get an LP in this patient, and you're going to see uh, uh, xanthochromia in this patient, which tells you that uh, there's actual active bleed. Now, this is different from a 
traumatic tap because you might be thinking, well, how do I know that I just, how do I know that I didn't hit an artery as I was going in? In that case, you're just going to see a few red blood cells, but you shouldn't see the anthocomia in this patient. If the anthocomia is present, then it's most likely subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, so management, uh, again, a little bit above your level, but I thought it'd be nice to kind of introduce it. Um, depending on the patient, most of them will require ICU care. Blood pressure management on all of our bleeders, very important. You wanna make sure that systolic blood pressures are low. And prophylactically, you give them calcium channel blockers to prevent vasospasm occurring uh, and resulting in a secondary ischemia um, in these patients. Uh, and if there's an aneurysm um, uh, that you saw on a CTA, um, you go in and you can surgically or endovascularly clip or coil it respectively and give them surgical prophylaxis as well because there is an increased risk of them seizing. You don't have to continue it after the patient is being discharged, but something that you can um, start in the hospital itself. Uh, some of the complications, you can have re-bleed occurring. Now, if you did go in surgically or endovascularly to either clip it or coil it, you decrease the risk, but it can happen. Vasospasm is a complication. Again, you give them calcium channel blockers to prevent that. Hydrocephalus uh, can occur again. Any like inf Infection can cause inflammation. Bleeding can cause inflammation and damage those arachnoid granules. So you can get hydrocephalus, and these patients um, down the line might need a VP shunt. Um, and then hyponatremia due to SIADH. So now we have another patient um, you have, and we're getting towards the end of the slide. So uh, we have a 40 year old uh, female, a uh, pregnant female, this is important. She's presenting with headache, vomiting, uh, vision problem, and focal neurological deficits. Fundoscopic examination shows papillary edema. Now, this is pretty vague description. So they have to give you, um, it would, you would look through your multiple choice answer and try to figure out, okay, which one could really, um, which meets all of these criteria. But what are you guys thinking right now? So you have a pregnant woman. There's a reason why they said she was pregnant. So keep that in mind. She has headache, vomiting, visual disturbances, focal neurological deficits. And she has increased intracranial pressure because she has proper edema. Any thoughts? Oh. This is hard. Uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia. Uh, that's actually not. Um, those are actually pretty good answers. Yeah, those can cause uh, stroke-like symptoms. Um, so those aren't bad. But think about the headache, vomiting. But that's actually a really good answer. So like, let's say now they showed you something like this, because this is a pretty vague stem itself. Um, so let's. Say they showed you this image, and I'm pointing out the abnormality right there. So, what is this? What are we looking at? Okay, so venous thrombosis. Yeah. So it's uh yeah it's the it's the dural venous thrombosis, and so just kind of going over the normal anatomy of it, you have your superior sagittal sinus, your inferior sagittal sinus, vein of Galen straight sinus, and those two come together. You have the confluence right here, transverse sigmoid, and then it kind of goes into your interjugular vein. So venous sinus thrombosis um, is, um, you have thrombosis of the cerebral veins or the dural sinus itself, and it can result in increased intracranial hypertension, which in, uh, predisposes you to ischemia and hemorrhage. Uh, so the causes tend to be, pro you have to be in a prothrombotic state. It could be genetic, it could be your on oral contraceptives, pregnancy or malignancy. And the presentation tends to be very vague with signs of headache, um, as well as other signs of in uh, increased intracranial pressure. Uh, diagnosis made with MRI venogram or brain MRI, where you'll see the opacification of the uh, venous sinuses or lack of opacification if you're doing it uh, with contrast. Um, and then management is you anticoagulate them and it's long-term warfarin or uh, DOAGs are used. Okay. okay. So could we go back to the image? Do you want to see the image again? Uh, I hope, I don't know which image, but. This is the image? Was it for the? Yeah, I can, I can tell. Image. Yes, 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 this is the image. Yeah, and I can forward you guys these slides if you guys want. And we're recording it, so yeah, I can upload them in that same place. But yeah, they said thank you. Okay. No problem.
All right, so 40 year old female presents with fever, periorbital edema, lateral gaze palsy, typical examination, significant for cranial nerve three deficit, um, and changes in sensation over the V1 and V2 dermatomes. What are you thinking? This is also a pretty difficult question, but you guys have been doing great. So. There was a question, a comment earlier on uh, Plavix clopidogram for stroke so usually that's people use aspirin but um uh, plavix you'll see it commonly for people who've gotten stenting uh, you know if they've had an intervention mm -hmm. so we use pl yeah. uh, plavix for keeping the stents open i just wanted to make sure that that question is answered yeah, yeah. okay so now and then this you know uh it's correct this can be very confusing the last case for the caverna sign uh, no the superior sagittal sinus thrombosis and eclampsia. But you know that uh, eclampsia, you will need the proteins and um, like the urinalysis. And eclampsia mm. typically gives you seizures instead of a focal neurologic deficit, like an arm is not moving, like clinically. And, and blood pressure is very important, right? With preeclampsia, the blood pressure parameters have to be met. Yeah. So uh, this, the answer you're getting here is giant arteritis, cavernous sinus thrombosis, aneurysm, compressing ocular motor nerve, and probably posterior communicating artery. So all over. So, so the answer is actually um, cavernous sinus thrombosis. And it's important to understand the anatomy of what is actually kind of going through uh, the cavernous sinus to be able to answer this question. So common causes of cavernous sinus thrombosis are infection, and, and that inflammation ultimately leads to thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. Uh, there's multiple cranial nerves that run through the cavernous sinus, so third, fourth, uh, sixth, uh, and then you have the trigeminal branches, the one and the two. And organisms that are commonly involved in this include uh, MRSA or MRSA, or MSSA or strep pneumo or veridin can cause this. And that's why a lot of sinus infection, facial infection, and dental infection can ascend because the drainage system is, uh, is connected and they can ascend and actually spread to the cavernous sinus, cause inflammation. And inflammation is a thrombogenic state and can cause thrombosis. And because of thrombosis, you have increased uh, pressure buildup and you have, uh, you have palsies of these particular nerves. So that's why they'll present with increased pressure. You'll have headache, fever, periorbital edema. This kind of tells you that there's an underlying infectious etiology, lateral gaze palsy. Um, that is because of the cranial nerve uh, three being affected. Um, and so the cranial nerve three, four, and six being affected. And then you have changes in sensation over the forehead um and the upper face area that's where the trigeminal innervation runs again the diagnosis via ct or mri with contrast and the treatment here is just treating the underlying infection and then surgical drainage uh is for very severe cases you're not really strong on anticoagulation you're just treating the underlying infection itself that's very important to kind of keep in mind questions regarding this because this is a confusing We good on this one? Yeah. I don't see any okay. uh, comments or questions. Okay. okay. So now you have a 60 year old male status post motor vehicle collision um, presents with progressive neurological decline. And this is what the CT non con looks like. What are you thinking? Okay, subdural hematoma, couple mm -hmm. of for subdural hematoma. Mm -hmm. So good. Now, uh, we had a question, how do you differentiate subdural hematomas from epidural? So hopefully we'll be able to address that with these last two slides. So subdural hematoma, you have bleeding into the potential space between the dura and the arachnoid uh, membrane. And it's due to mainly rupture of uh, bridging veins that drain the brain uh, to the uh, dural sinuses. And it's really, it, it can be, but it's really due to arterial bleed, and that's more common in children if that happens. So the etiology here tends to be mainly trauma. 
uh, and in a particular population. So it could be trauma in an elderly population, uh, like a ground level fall sometimes, or a prior total brain injury, or patient with alcohol abuse because they have atrophy of their brain occurring. So there's more strain in both elderly and patient who um, abuse alcohol. They have atrophy of the brain, and you have strain on those bridging veins. So you have a lot of tension. So when even a small uh, trauma occurs at increased risk of rupture or injury, and then you get the subsequent bleed occurring. Uh, so the uh, CT finding is a crescent hyperdense uh, uh, fluid collection, or not fluid, but blood collection, extraaxia collection that actually crosses the suture line. And that's just characteristic of the subdural space, right? Uh, and this is very important because with epidural hematomas, we'll see that they don't cross the suture line, and that's why they don't form this crescent line, but rather a lentiform shape. Um, acute managed, um, certain cases, um, you might have to take them to the OR, especially if there's signs of herniation. Uh, there's severe increase in intracranial pressure, or if the clot itself, right, if the diameter of the hematoma is greater than 10 millimeter, or the midline shift is greater than 5 millimeter, or the patient's continuously just deteriorating. Those, all of these would indicate need to take them to, to the OR and evacuate this. Non-operative management, if none of the above uh, is present, you just do serial CT and make sure that it's stable and it's not progressively getting worse. And you just manage uh, the increased intracranial pressure by head elevation, hyperventilation, and mannitol. Uh, if they have um, a chronic um, subdural hematoma, surgery is only indicated if there's severe progressive neurological decline, or again, if the clot is thicker than 10 millimeters, or there's a, a greater than five millimeter midline shift. Now here's our companion case, a uh, 40-year-old male, uh, status quo is blunt, head trauma, presents with headaches, vomiting, with lucent interval, this is very important, and, and subsequent deterioration. So he felt a little bit good, and all of a sudden started to just deteriorate in, uh, from a neurological standpoint. So this will differentiate the two etiologies. And this is what the CT looks like. Uh, epidural? But yes. So a question, what's TBI? Uh, total brain injury. From total? total mm -hmm. okay. Oh, sorry, no, traumatic okay. brain injury. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. multiple answers of epidural. Yes, that is correct. So this is epidural hematoma. This is uh, bleeding uh, within the potential space uh, within uh, between the skull and the dura itself. And remember, dura attaches to the skull at the sutures um, uh, at the suture lines themselves. So here, the bleed will not extend beyond the suture line. And because it's confined to a particular space, instead of fo uh, forming that crescent shape, it actually forms this lentiform configuration on CT. Uh, again, uh, one of the key areas is the uh, petrous part uh, where you have a uh, petrous part of the skull where the injury can occur and the main vessel uh, that's affected here is the middle meningeal or um, clinical presentation like we talked about, altered mental status, confusion, drowsiness, headache, vomiting, and it's this lucent interval where, um, sorry, it's the lucent interval where they'll like improve and then subsequently start to go down the hill again, so start to deteriorate. And diagnosis is a non con CT. In the case of, um, uh, if it's urgent or in case of um, urgent management, you would do an evacuation of the hematoma. If the patient, however, is asymptomatic and you just incidentally found this, then you can do non-operative management, which is rarely the case. Yep, that is it for the first part. Uh, do you guys have any question, any recommendation for the second part? Um, now. First off, I mean, as people comment, I would, oh, okay. What's the difference between using non-contrast CT and contrast CT? Okay, so um, let's think through it together. So if, there's an active bleed occurring. Would you be able to pick that up with contrast CT? Mm, no, no. Right, so it's the contrast itself. You wouldn't be able to tell what you're seeing is it's contrast of the blood itself. Because as the blood, uh, so just kind of going back to CT head and how, the, how do they actually work, 
when you have a really acute bleed, uh, when it hasn't uh, clotted yet, like uh, really, really acute bleed, it actually is hypodense. And within a few minutes, it actually will start to clot and uh, minute to hours, and then that becomes hyperdense. And you can actually see that on a non-contrast um, CT scan. And sometimes you can actually get what is known as the swirl sign, where you have a hyperdense uh, hyper opacity, and within it, you have some hypodense component. That tells you that there's active bleeding occurring. Um, so the essence of contrast allows us to pick up the bleed itself. Okay. We can show some examples of that next time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also a question of how to differentiate acute and chronic. So that's based off of densities. Um, so an acute is going to be uh, more hyper hyper dense, where chronic, the blood products will slowly start to break uh, break down, and its the density will actually become less and less and closer to the brain parenchyma. Okay. So it's going to be darker. So we can we can show some examples for yeah. And then um, a question for discussion. What area is affected when a patient has one-sided weakness since it does not fit in vascular territories? I think we would require a little more information. Are you talking mm -hmm. about like a one-sided arm or one-sided yeah. leg or arm and... Mm -hmm. And you also have to then think about infectious like... Uh um what Lyme disease as well right whether or not that's causing the weakness and you also have to figure out is it peripheral nervous system or central nervous system and they should be giving you clues to that okay so um so when you have an arm and leg usually it's usually a stroke um and most of them will fit into a vascular territory unless you've injured uh, uh two places so mm -hmm. I think I need more information to ha to help you think about this. Um, uh, you know, unless so so let me investigate a little more. But uh, about just what? A, but, uh -huh. Just a general rule, though. Um, if your lower extremities are predominantly affected, then you're thinking it's more anterior cerebral artery. Um, if it is your face and upper extremities that are affecting, then you're thinking it's middle cerebral artery uh, that's involved within the stroke. So hopefully that helps. And we can true. Okay. So a um, couple of questions, actually. These are nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, could you share a recording of the meeting? I think everything I've been putting in the YouTube, I, I know I've been behind on updating it, but the YouTube link now has most of them. The ones I did not record on my computer, I need uh, for people to send them so that I can upload them, but they're there. There's thank you. The question for Sheila is still there, but we can tackle that with sort of like maybe a recap of where, where the lesion is in stroke and where the symptoms are you know? Right. Uh, and what I'll do next, mm -hmm. uh, what I'll do next time is uh, come up with a um, chart for you guys. If the anterior cerebral artery is affected, what type of symptoms you would uh, see, which is going to be mainly lower extremity predominant, middle cerebral artery, what would you see? And I'll um, develop something like that for you guys, because that will help during test knowing. Yeah. And then, uh, why is increased intracranial pressure contraindicated in lum lumbar puncture? Um, so what ends up, so what can happen if you um, put a needle in, into the CSS? So you are actually alleviating that pressure, so that can actually promote the um, herniation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the patient will die, this has happened in real life so you have to well you may not have the fundoscopy before your lumbar puncture you have to make sure you're doing your exam to make sure that you're mm -hmm. doing a, a complete neuro exam mm -hmm. and uh, that's super helpful because if you suspect anything because sometimes you may not have imaging all the time then you yeah. should order a CT scan and do the uh, fundoscopy exam which sometimes can be difficult uh, because you are not seeing through, you know, you're in a bright room and mm -hmm. you may not have like the dilation. Uh, 
but your physical examination is going to be your guide and you can save a patient in life just because of this. Um, what's the pathophysiology of hearing loss as a complication of meningitis? It's just fibrosis of the, the cranial nerves um, eight that's involved in the hearing process itself. It's local inflammation and then fibrosis near the nerve itself. Okay. Uh, I see a question, ischemia versus bleed on CT? Um, so um, remember, we get, um, uh, that's a good question. So there's a couple of findings. Um, let me see. And it's okay if we also have session two. If you feel like we can also show some mm -hmm. examples in session two, we'll just. Yeah. yeah, so ischemia versus bleed, a couple of things to keep in mind. Ischemia, you'll actually notice that the, there's going to be a lot of edema uh, surrounding the areas where the infarct is occurring, and they tend to be a, um, a little bit uh, darker in appearance, uh, and you have loss of gray-white differentiation. And uh, like Dr. Couture is saying, I'll put in images um, and let me take note of that. Um, so I can actually just, and going through these images wouldn't be um, that time consuming and I can do that quickly. So I'll make sure to go over um, those images. I'm sure you guys have differences, but they're very subtle. And in acute cases, you won't even see some of these subtle ischemic changes. So you, what you're really looking for, the um, symptoms itself are sufficient for you to be like, this is a stroke. And then the second thing is, is there a bleed? That's what your so that's what your thought process is. Sometimes you'll see ischemic changes, uh, but sometimes it might be too early for you to see those. But we'll go over those. There's a question: When do you do decompressive craniectomy or thrombectomy in stroke, and the timing for that? Maybe we should get the neuro interventionalist to come speak. Yeah. How they take care of stroke. There's yeah. Lots of for for this. Uh, um, but what was it? Uh, he uh, they so said when, when do we do, do craniectomy or thrombectomy in stroke and the timings. So I don't um, craniectomy. I would only think that there's like I thrombectomy. I know uh, its role in stroke, but craniectomy I've never really seen that really be used. But uh, a lot of the time, uh, if they're out of the TPA window of four point five seconds, and there's uh, CTA um, finding or MRA findings showing that there's significant amount of plaque. Uh, I think up to eight hours you can do thrombectomy. There's still a good candidate for thrombectomy. So if they're out of the window for TPA um, and the patient's coming with these symptoms and you have image finding significant of a uh, significant amount of plaque and they're still within six to eight hours, you can go in and do a thrombectomy in these patients and get some of that, um, some of the blood. Um, to the tissue, because um, this is kind of getting into a little bit more advanced level because uh, uh, other studies that we kind of look at in our stroke patients are perfusion studies. And those tell us whether or not there's, um, those studies allow us to see tissue that's completely ischemic, meaning no matter what we do, uh, we can't save that tissue. And then there's another parameter that allows us to see tissue that's at risk. And that is tissue that we can save if we were to intervene. And it really depends on if there's significant amount of tissue at risk and the time interval. Where are we in that time interval? If we're less than four hours since the symptom onset, we give TPA and there's no contraindication, we give TPA. We're outside that four hour, but they, then we have a lot of tissue that is um, at risk that we can save, then we can go in and do thrombectomy up to like eight hours at least. I would say that uh, if there's quite some interest in just understanding like stroke care and what people do with that. We are happy to look for someone. That won't be exam focused. That's just going to be a didactic. I, look, I know Salim is pro-neurology, but that will need a little more votes from other people if they're interested in hearing about that. Sort of like what's the state of the art. We can get just the same way like uh, myself, hopefully Fiza is going to follow us and Janice do all the interventions below the, the head. And uh, there are other doctors who do interventions in the head and those are neuro strokes. So, um, okay, so lots of thank you very much. Great presentation. I mean, the, this chat has probably been the busiest today, uh, Fiza. So thank you so much. Lots of high yield material here. Uh, I encourage you to go back and really rewatch. I'll put actually the PowerPoints too uh, in, in the YouTube link.
uh, because this is going to be uh, just something that there's just so much to unpack here and uh, can make neuro uh, a little more easy. Well, we need to clarify a little more. I've taken some notes and we'll include it uh, on next time. Uh, Fiza, do you have yeah. some final words? And then I'll, I think Janice left some final word here that I will read to everyone. But, uh, um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope everything made sense. Please give me feedback as to how I can improve the lectures. If you guys like the question format better, um, I can do that. And it's a pleasure and, um, to be able to give these lectures to you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, the final word today is um, uh, from Dr. Newsom is discipline weighs ounces, but regrets weighs tons. So which one will you live in? Let's not, let's not live in regrets, but stick to the hard work of discipline and expectations. So have a lovely weekend. Uh, uh, I'll be in the East African region soon. And um, this was great. Lecture was well done, great format. And, uh, and, and so the, uh, okay. And so usually at the end of this lecture, you get an email that says, thank you for participating. So you will get the link for the YouTube there. Okay, uh, that's it. Very, very engaging uh, on chat. So thank you, thank you. And have a good uh, time. Bye. Take care. Bye.